Democrats battle it out for supremacy on the undercard, and we prepare for the bigger fight on the main card. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Bienvenidos, amigos, a la Ben Shapiro Show, donde no hablamos español, pero no riemos de las personas que piensan que sí. I know, you thought you were listening to the Democratic debate last night. So, the Democratic debate is a thing that happened last night. And I didn't drink cyanide, which was my prediction yesterday. So not all of my predictions come true. I survived it. I, I feel like I should get one of those one of those t-shirts that says, I survived the first Democratic debate and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. But I'll tell you who didn't survive. It was Beto O'Rourke. I mean, Beto O'Rourke, basically they wheeled his prone body out of the room after this debate. So we're going to go through all of the various candidates. Did they have a good night? Did they have a bad night? I'll tell you who the big winner was last night. Donald J. Trump. That dude had a great night last night because this was not just a clown car. This was all of the clowns popped out of the car and then started ramming each other with foam pillows. That's it. This was all of the clowns decided to stuff themselves back into a phone booth and then wrestle with one another. No one looked good. Everyone looked stupid. And one thing that became deeply apparent is that the entire Democratic Party with maybe the exception of Joe Biden. When Joe Biden's the only sane person in your party, you are jacked, man. But the Democratic Party has decided that the only reason they exist is to pander to the political geniuses on Twitter. The polls show that the vast majority of Democrats are fairly moderate in their views on everything from abortion. Yes, they are in favor of some restrictions on abortion to Medicare. They are not in favor of Medicare for all. They want to keep their private health care plans. The vast majority of Democrats are fairly moderate on immigration. They do want to see our border policed. And yet the entirety of the Democratic Party last night competed to see who could say the most insane, extreme thing in the stupidest possible way. Now, one of the joys of watching these debates is watching some of the puffed up balloons of these politicians just explode. And Beto O'Rourke really had the roughest night. It's hard to say who won because no one really ended up the big winner, but there was a very clear loser. Everyone knew it. And that clear loser was Beto. Now, the reason that Beto was the clear loser is because he was the easiest target. Now, he's only polling at 3 or 4%. He still has scads of money in his back pocket, but he was polling really badly. And one of the reasons that he was polling really badly is because he had been built up so much during his Senate race with Ted Cruz. So he runs against Ted Cruz, who is an, an unlikable politician. A lot of people think that, that he is unlikable. The media obviously despise him in a deep and profound way. And because the media despise him in this deep and profound way, they decided to build up Beto as though Beto was a thing. There were stories on him. HBO did an entire documentary, Running with Beto, which is just the worst thing that ever was. And they, they suggested that he was charismatic. Look at how amazing he is. It just goes to show you that when the media build up somebody as charismatic, three quarters of that is the media building somebody up as charismatic, not actual charisma. And Beto was just ripe for the plucking here. Beto was ready to fall. He was, he was Mike Tyson before Buster Douglas, and then Buster Douglas came along, and then Mike Tyson started losing every other fight. And that is what has happened with Beto O'Rourke. Beto O'Rourke is toast, and all the other candidates are going to make hay out of simply punching him in the face over and over and over, as we will see. Okay, so we're going to get to all of the highlights and the lowlights, the joy and the despair, the laughter and the tears, the pregnant men. Yes, that's a thing that happened. And all of the other stupidity, but first... Good blinds are to a home what a good tie is to a suit. It brings it all together. You know, your house, it may look like crap. And you're like, well, everything else here is nice. Why does my house look like crap? It's because you didn't actually look at the stuff that's covering your windows. You should, and you should replace it the best way with blinds.com. They make it really fast and really easy to shop for window coverings. This is why I like them. With 15 million windows covered, over 30,000 five-star customer reviews, blinds.com is America's number one online retailer for affordable quality custom window coverings. Every single order gets free samples, free shipping, a free online design consultation. You just send them pictures of your house. They send back custom recommendations from a professional for what will work with your color scheme, your furniture, specific rooms. They will even send you free samples to make sure that everything looks as good in person as it does online. They've really made it easy for you, so there's no excuse to leave up those mangled blinds, or worse, have no blinds at all, because that's not a great idea. For a limited time, my listeners get $20 off at blinds.com when you use promo code Ben. That is blinds.com, promo code Ben for $20 off. Faux wood blinds, cellular shades, roller shades, and more. Blinds.com, promo code Ben. Go check them out right now. Rules and regulations do apply. Go check them out. It's a great deal. 20 bucks off at blinds.com. 
when you use promo code Ben. Cover up those windows, make your house look better. I promise, you're not gonna regret it. Blinds.com, promo code Ben. Okay, so we begin last night with Beto falling. So Beto is basically Jeb 2016. So Jeb came into the race, he was the front runner, and then Donald Trump really just pummeled the living crap out of him, and so did everybody else. Every so often, somebody needed a boost, and Jeb Bush was like the cocaine of that race. Like if anybody needed a bump, they just went over to Jeb Bush, punched him, and then gained a couple of points in the polls. Well, Beto is that. So Beto is highly irritating to everyone because he's so puffed up and has such a sense of his own grandeur after losing a Senate race, which is his only qualification for running for president of the United States. After believing that the media were on his side, I mean, you have to feel a little bad for Beto, Beto, because the fact is that everybody told him how wonderful he was until the minute he wasn't running against Ted Cruz anymore. And then they're like, yeah, that guy, isn't he kind of annoying? Doesn't he have these weird mannerisms? Isn't his personal history kind of odd? Isn't he a rich boy playing at Man of the People? And you got to feel bad for him a little bit because he's standing there going, wait, I'm the same person I was five... Bro, I'm who I was five seconds ago. Why are you ripping on me? I'm just here ripping this bong. Why are you ripping on me, brah? And that's how it went. So the debate opens last night and Beto is asked a question about his preferred tax rate. Beto dodges the question by jumping into speaking Spanish. And Cory Booker gives him some of the most epic side eye in history. So Cory Booker, Mr. Potato Head, didn't just bring his angry eyes last night. He also brought his side eyes last night and the visuals were astounding. Here's what it sounded like. Some Democrats want a marginal individual tax rate of 70% on the very highest earners, those making more than $10 million a year. Would you support that? And if not, what would your top individual rate be? Necesitamos incluir cada persona en el éxito de esta economía. Pero si queremos hacer eso, necesitamos incluir cada persona en nuestra democracia. Uh, cada votar, ca cada votante necesita... <laughs> see Cory Booker looking at him like, Elizabeth Warren is like, what is going on? And Cory Booker is like, I can't believe I have to learn Mandarin before the next debate. Like, this, is, like, this is, it's so funny. He's asked a question in English and Beto just starts riffing on all of this. I mean, basically, it, the, I, the, the, I think the best part of this is that he avoided the question in Spanish. So he didn't actually answer the question in Spanish. He avoided the question in Spanish, which, by the way, I think is actually a pretty great tactic. I think that next time somebody asks Cory Booker or, or, or Beto or anybody on stage who speaks Spanish, next time somebody asks them a question in English they don't like, they, th they should just say, yo no hablo inglés. Right? Like, I don't get it, man. I, I don't speak English. And then they should just launch into a long speech in Spanish. Cory Booker looking unimpressed at Beto's Spanish is one, of the great, is one of the great moments. I mean, this screen cap is the meme. Everybody looking at Beto like, what is going on? <laughs> but don't worry, as we will see, Cory Booker himself also awkwardly spoke Spanish. So this became sort of the theme of the night. I'm going to have to show you that real fast. So here is Cory Booker also awkwardly speaking Spanish. It turns out that the side eye that Booker was casting at Beto was just because he was mad that Beto spoke Spanish before he did. In fact, both Booker and Beto spoke Spanish before Julian Castro, the actual Hispanic person in the race. So here is Cory Booker speaking Spanish. Both of them, by the way, I have been told my Spanish, as you can tell, is not good. Both of them, I've been told, speak Spanish not particularly well. So this got kind of awkward. Senator Booker, what would you do on day one? And this is a situation that the next president will inherit. La situación, la situación ahora es inaceptable. Es de presidente ha atacado, ha demonizado los inmigrantes. Es inaceptable. Voy a cambiar este. On day one, I will make sure that number one, we end the ICE policies and the customs and border policies that are violating the human rights. Okay, so again, the speaking of the Spanish. Now, the only person who was really disturbed by this, the most disturbed person, was Elizabeth Warren. She truly wanted to get in on the act because she is the least diverse person on the stage. So the act that she wanted to get in on. She was, I promise you, you looked at her, she was five seconds away from trying to speak Cherokee. She was so close to breaking out the Navajo wind talking. It was like this far away from Elizabeth Warren. Okay, so, so Beto starts the debate this way. And then Beto gets clubbed by Bill de Blasio. You know, getting clubbed by Frankenstein, is a, it's, it's gotta be an unpleasant experience. I mean, Bill de Blasio is eight foot three, gawky, awkward, a serial groundhog murderer, 
and Bill de Blasio is standing there slamming Beto. Why, why is he slamming Beto? What's the rip on Beto? The rip on Beto is he's too moderate. Why? Because Beto didn't call for the total nationalization of healthcare and the banning of private healthcare plans. Now, no one last night attacked Elizabeth Warren. The reason no one attacked Elizabeth Warren is because I think everybody sort of understood that if you attacked Warren, it was likely to backfire because the media love Warren right now. She is their golden girl and they are going, that's not a reference to her age. They were going to, they were then going to protect her. There's this patina of freshness about Elizabeth Warren, despite the fact she's not a fresh politician. And if anybody clocked her, it was going to backfire on them. Instead, why not beat up on the guy that everybody's beating up on, who's still polling kind of low. Let's all beat up on, on Beto. And that was the theme of the night. Basically, anybody who beat up on Beto benefited. So here's Bill de Blasio slamming Beto for not calling for total nationalization of health care. Would you replace private insurance? No, I, I think the choice is, is fundamental hey, to wait, wait. our Congress ability to get wrong. everybody yeah, cared for. Private insurance is not working for tens of millions of Americans. When you talk about the co-pays, the deductibles, the premiums, the out-of-pocket expenses, it's not working. <laughs> that's How right. can you so, defend so for those system for that's not, not working. working, they can choose Medicare. For the culinary workers in you Nevada who I listen to, who the negotiated for those working plans, for people. Uh, they're able to keep them. Why are you defending Americans private insurance? They like their private health insurance. Okay, this is amazing. So Bill de Blasio is clocking Beto. Beto's exactly right here, by the way. Beto is saying that a public option, meaning that people can opt into Medicare, which is still a bad idea, but he's saying that a public option is a better, more popular option than simply banning private health insurance, considering 177 million Americans are on private health insurance, and the vast majority of them are actually happy with the care they get from their private health insurers. But Beto is not sufficiently woke. And so begins the run to the left. As we will see, this becomes a theme over the course of the debate. Everyone running headlong to the left, right over that cliff, like Marxist lemmings. Pretty spectacular. We'll get to that in just a second. First, this 4th of July, in addition to drinking pure liquid freedom, because America, the only thing Americans should be drinking is Black Rifle Coffee. Black Rifle Coffee is awesome, okay? I have Black Rifle Coffee every single morning. Not only do I have Black Rifle Coffee, I love the dudes who run Black Rifle Coffee. They are awesome. The company was founded by former special operations vets. Black Rifle delivers the best roast to order coffee directly to your door. This guarantees that you're getting fresh premium coffee with every single order. Black Rifle's coffee club makes things easy. You just pick your blend and the amount you want. And then Black Rifle ships your coffee direct to your door every month hassle free. Plus, when you join their coffee club, you'll receive discounts and offers not available to other customers. When you drink Black Rifle coffee, you're supporting a company that gives back to veteran and first responder causes and serves coffee and culture to people who truly love America. So no more of that leftist tripe being served to you in paper cups at stores that let people go to the bathroom without buying anything. Instead, go to Black Rifle Coffee. The most American holiday calls for the most American coffee. Black Rifle Coffee. Get 20% off your first purchase when you shop at blackriflecoffee.com slash Ben. That is blackriflecoffee.com slash Ben. For 20% off your first purchase, that's blackriflecoffee.com slash Ben. Okay, so the consensus was that Beto fell and fell hard last night. That Beto is basically toast. Now, he was basically toast before, but he became everybody's favorite punching bag. When you are Bill de Blasio's punching bag, how far, how far the mighty have fallen. Somewhere, Jake Gyllenhaal weeps as he burns his Beto shirt. As all of Hollywood loved Beto until five seconds ago. So, very, very bad night for Beto O'Rourke. Now we move on to some of the other candidates. So Elizabeth Warren, how did her night go? Well, she was the front runner coming into the night and she really had to stand out, right? The idea was that she should have dominated. The expectations for her were high. Now, she didn't lose the debate. She didn't really get touched, but she didn't stand out from the rest of these dolts. She just stood on stage and kind of said stuff and, and what she really did do, there were a couple of ways in which she actually did damage herself, not in the primaries, but in the general. Where should we make the general? These would all become attack ads, and they become attack ads because Elizabeth Warren has made a big boo-boo. She has made a big boo-boo. Everybody in the Democratic Party has ceded the moderate lane to Joe Biden. Everyone. It's unbelievable. 40% of the Democratic Party still considers itself moderate to conservative. And all of these other dimwits, these numbskulls, are ceding that 40% to Joe Biden and clubbing each other over whether we should provide taxpayer mandate abortion, mandated abortions for animals or whether we should or whether we should provide illegal immigrants with not only health care, but subsidized New York lofts. I mean, that's what the debate turned into. And Elizabeth Warren was leading that charge. OK, so 
Elizabeth Warren comes in and she, all, all she has to do is handle herself decently. She did that. She's not going to lose any points, but she certainly didn't gain any points last night. She didn't win running away or anything like that. And she did do herself some damage if Democrats ever get to a general election, if she ever gets to a general election. So Elizabeth Warren, it starts off this way. She's asked about whether she would ever have any limits on abortion. There was unanimity across this stage that not a single Democrat would limit abortion under any circumstances. 18% of Americans agree with that proposal. 82% of Americans disagree with that proposal. It was unanimous on stage because this party has run off the rails to the left, at least the leadership, not the people who vote for it. The leadership has run off the rails to the left. What she's about to say is wild. Senator Warren, would you put limits on uh, any limits on abortion? I would make certain that every woman has access to the full range of reproductive health care services, and that includes birth control, it includes abortion, it includes everything for a woman. And I want to add on that, it's not enough for us to expect the courts to protect us. 47 years ago, Roe versus Wade was decided, and we've all looked to the courts all that time, as state after state has undermined Roe, has put in exceptions, has come right up to the edge of taking away protection. Your time is up, Senator. All she is a ball of nervous energy on that stage, calling for government intervention in every aspect of American life. So the question was, would you put any limits on abortion? And her answer was, not only would I not put limits, I would fund it and federally mandate that funding via the legislature. She's pretty incredible stuff. She does, uh, so much of these debates is about the aesthetics of it. And Elizabeth Warren basically is rabbit from Winnie the Pooh. She just runs around worrying about everything. And she has a plan for her garden. And she's irritating. I mean, I'm sorry. To put, I said it yesterday. I will say it again. She's an irritating human being. Amy Klobuchar is not an irritating human being. This is not about the sex of the person I'm speaking about. Amy Klobuchar is not an irritating human being. Tulsi Gabbard is not an irritating human being. Both of them last I checked were women. Uh, they self-identify that way. So that's all that matters these days. In any case, Elizabeth Warren, again, she's wearing well with the media class, but I'm not sure this stuff is going to wear well with the American public. I mean, listen to her talk. So, so they ask a question on stage. How many of you would abolish private health insurance? Understand, no one wants private health insurance abolished in the United States. The number of people who want private health insurance abolished in the United States, it's in like the 20% range. No one wants this, which is why when this question is asked, only two hands go up for abolishing private health insurance. Bill de Blasio, an actual communist, and Elizabeth Warren, a wannabe communist, who used to say that she was a capitalist and used to talk about the glories of the free market and how we make that free market work better. That was her, her sort of pitch. Well, now she's run all the way to the left. Why? Because she's trying to head off Bernie at the pass. She feels like if she can cannibalize Bernie and then eat his desiccated old body, then she will take over his wing of the party. Now, maybe that's a good strategy for a primary. I don't know there are enough voters there, but it's certainly not a good strategy for a general election. You think this won't be an ad? You think that Donald Trump won't be able to say, Elizabeth Warren wants you to lose your health insurance? Because she does. That's what she's saying right here. 177 million Americans, over 90% of Americans are happy with the health insurance that they currently have. Okay, or at least they have health insurance. Okay, 90, well over 90% of Americans have health insurance and something like 70% of all Americans have privately provided health insurance. Okay, well, here is Elizabeth Warren raising her hand when asked if she would abolish private health insurance. So everyone who's listening to this, you, me, all of us, we wouldn't have private health insurance. We'd be forced into the Medicare system, which is already underfunded, overburdened, and would quickly run into the bankruptcy numbers extraordinarily fast. I mean, it will be bankrupt by the end of the 2020s anyway. So I guess we can accelerate that and make it bankrupt next year by throwing a bunch of people onto it without properly funding it. And then I suppose we'll have to cram down on doctors who they can care for and who they can't. That's the other half of this. And there are folks on the left who say, well, you know, doctors voluntarily take Medicare right now. Right, because they can choose not to or they can choose to do so. If Medicare is the only system, that means that Medicare is the sole bargaining entity with doctors. And that means that the government can cram down basically whatever they want on doctors. And then doctors will be forced to take it or they'll be forced to drop out of, of the doctoring business. And that's, that's effectively what Elizabeth Warren is arguing for here. She's not arguing for a public option. She's not arguing that you should be able to buy government health insurance or use government health insurance as an alternative to the private market. A proposition I think leads gradually and inevitably toward nationalized healthcare, but which is not nationalized healthcare. She's arguing for the full abolition of private healthcare in the United States. Good luck with this one in a general. 
to turn to the issue of health care right now. I'd really try to understand where there may or may not be daylight between you. Many people watching at home have health insurance coverage through their employer. Who here would abolish their private health insurance in favor of a government-run plan? Just a show of hands, starting off with. Okay, so no one else on stage would abolish their own private insurance to take a government plan. Bill de Blasio would because that dude is happy to mooch off the government all the time. Elizabeth Warren is a cynical lady. And so what she is doing there is trying to head off Bernie at the pass. In fact, during the debate, she suggested that she, like Bernie, is for Medicare for all. It was a pretty obvious appeal. And that wasn't the extent of Warren's extremism on the stage. This is a lady who is solely concerned with knocking Bernie out early and then pivoting to the middle. But there's one problem. There's a thing, and it's called video, and it exists now. Now, 30 years ago, you could do this routine where you basically lied to the American people in either the primaries or the general. Now, you ran to the extreme, and then you shifted to the middle for the general election. But in today's day and age, what you say in the primaries matters. Most of the quotes that people have from President Trump occurred during the primaries. The primaries outlive the primaries. They didn't used to, but they do now. So when Warren is asked about gun confiscation, and she basically signals that, yeah, she might be interested in having the government come into your house and take guns. Is this going to play in a general? I have some serious doubts. Do you think the federal government needs to go and figure out a way to get the guns that are so, already out there? What I think we need to do is quickly. we need to treat it like a serious research problem, which we have not done. Okay. You know, guns in the hands of a collector who's had them for decades, who's never fired them, who takes safety right. seriously, that's very different from guns that are sold and turned over quickly. We can't treat this as an across-the-board problem. We have to treat it like a public health emergency. Senate. That means bring data to bear, okay. and it means make real change in this country, you, whether Senator. it's politically popular or not. Okay, so again, she, she avoids the question because the actual answer is yes, I would try to confiscate guns. She could just answer it, but she, even, even Elizabeth Warren understands that she can't say that one out loud. Well, in a second, we'll get to the rest of the Democratic candidates. And also, I have a question. I have a question. There were two terms that did not come up on stage last night nearly at all, and it's pretty incredible, and it shows where the Democratic Party is. First, I'm on the internet basically 24 hours a day. I'm sleeping. I'm still on the internet. I'm concerned about hackers stealing my data, because you should be too. And that's why I trust ExpressVPN to protect my online activity. You should too. Hackers, government, internet companies, basically everyone, they're all looking for your data. They're looking to gobble it up. ExpressVPN runs in the background of your computer or phone, and then you just use the internet the way you normally would. You download the app, you click to connect, voila, you are now protected by their powerful encryption technology. I never go online without ExpressVPN. You shouldn't either. ExpressVPN is the fastest VPN I've tried. It costs less than seven bucks a month. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Stop hackers, big brother, internet companies from grabbing all your data. Take back that online privacy the way I did. Use ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today. Seriously, it's very important. Find out how you can get three months for free at expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben. For three months free with a one-year package, visit expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Online security is deeply important. If you think they're not out to get your data, you are wrong. Go check them out right now. Expressvpn.com slash Ben. Three months free with a one-year package. Okay, so there are two terms that did not come up last night. And then we'll get to the rest of these candidates. There were two terms that did not come up last night. Obama and Trump. And that's kind of shocking. Obama didn't come up because the Democratic Party has left him behind. This is the biggest problem for Joe Biden, is that Joe Biden tonight will be on stage trying to defend Barack Obama's record. And he has a record to defend. And that record isn't great. People don't like Obamacare. Obamacare has been unworkable. People don't like Obama's foreign policy particularly much. That was unworkable. Joe Biden will have to defend that. There's a reason none of the Democrats were out there paying homage to Barack Obama. That's because his presidency was not very good. He did not do a lot of good things for people. And so people have sort of been ignoring the fact that Obama was president for eight years. More oddly, the other term that did not come up a lot last night was Trump. And that's really interesting because I think that, I assume that the calculus for these Democrats is that they all thought that the other Democrats were going to attack Trump, and so they were going to distinguish themselves by talking about policy. But instead, there was sort of a prisoner's dilemma, and they all ended up talking about their crazy, insane, out-of-the-box policy instead of talking about the one thing that unifies their party and unifies a lot of Americans, hatred for President Trump. Trump's name was mentioned only 20 times in two hours, which is a very, very low number for an incumbent president running against a field of millions. That's kind of astonishing. The other reason they're not attacking Trump, of course, is that his actual record is pretty good. This debate started 
with a bunch of Democrats proclaiming to the skies that the economy is actually bad. Now, no one actually believes that. No one actually believes that the, that the economy is bad in this, in this cycle. It just isn't. The economy is very strong. Elizabeth Warren was complaining that only people at the top were making money off this economy. That is absolutely untrue. We've seen wage increases faster than they have done for years. We've seen the unemployment rate at record lows. We've seen black unemployment at record lows, Hispanic unemployment at record lows. We have seen real economic growth under this president. Like him or hate him, that is a fact. And the Democrats somehow have to avoid that. And I guess they didn't want to discuss Trump because if they did, it might remind people that Trump is still out there. And then there's the final problem with discussing Trump. And that is that all of these Democrats next to each other, they look like Lilliputians. Donald Trump is an outsized personality. He is. There, there's a tendency for people who are president to make themselves feel indispensable in daily life, feel like they occupy the vacuum. Like they're just there all the time. Barack Obama did this. He was very effective at doing this. He made it so it was almost impossible to think of government or the presidency without thinking of Obama. Trump has done the same thing, except even more so because he has dominated media coverage so thoroughly. So when you think of any of those Democrats standing up against President Trump, Trump looks 10 feet tall and these Democrats look like Lilliputians. Maybe that's because they're still in the primaries. Maybe they emerge. But the only major figure in the Democratic Party right now is Joe Biden. All these other people are minor players. And you could see that last night as they haggled over which groups to pander to. So Cory Booker, Mr. Potato Head, he went out there, he took out his angry eyes, he slapped him on. And then he started talking about the various groups that have been left behind. Now, again, it's amazing. The Democratic Party requires a bunch of blue collar white people to vote for it if they want to win the presidency in 2020. But the groups that they keep talking to are the smallest minority groups that they can find. So they just keep breaking Americans down into these smaller and smaller identity groups and then overtly appealing to them, maybe to look sympathetic, I guess, or maybe because they really believe they can outwoke everybody else on the stage. So Cory Booker tried to outwoke everybody by saying, you know who we don't appeal to? Black people, which of course is utterly untrue. The Democratic Party is severely concerned and supremely concerned with the interests of its black electorate, which is why Cory Booker's on the stage because Cory Booker is not a good candidate, but presumably his entire pitch is to the black community, don't vote for that old white guy who used to hang out with segregationists. I mean, this is what he said last week, vote instead for me. Well, Cory Booker then went even further and he said, you know who we really have not spent enough time on? Black trans people. So eventually he's gonna find the person who he feels we really have not spent enough time on, the black, lesbian, trans, little person who is half Native American and also a quarter Korean. That's where, that will be Cory Booker's constituent. But the strategy that says ignore the vast bulk of the American electorate to focus on small segments of the electorate and suggest that those small segments of the electorate are being ignored, if you cobble enough of them together, you have a coalition. Good luck with that, Cory Booker. Look, civil rights is some place to begin, but in the African-American civil rights community, another place to focus on was to stop the lynching of African-Americans. We do not talk enough about trans Americans, especially African American trans Americans, and the incredibly high rates of murder right now. We don't talk enough about how many children, about 30% of LGBTQ kids, who do not go to school because of fear. It's not enough just to be on the Equality Act. I'm an original co-sponsor. We need to have a president that will fight to okay. protect LGBTQ Americans Thank every you. single day from violence. Thank you, Senator. That's definitely going to win him back Ohio right there. Uh, that, that right there is definitely going to win him back Ohio. Okay, by the way, I will just point out that there's a factual error in what he says. He talks about the murder rates against transgender Americans. Andy No, who has done a lot of research on this, he points out that there were 26 murders of transgender people last year. The vast bulk of them had to do with, were actually not, were actually black transgender people who were killed by other members of minority groups. There is, there's a serious sexual violence problem against people who are engaged in the sex industry, in other words, prostitution. There are a lot of cross-cutting issues here. And Cory Booker just makes it into America's racist, America's terrible, America hates gay people. It's absolute nonsense, but I guess this is the pitch. And he wasn't, but, but this was his breakout moment, right? I mean, he was outwoking people. The, the general consensus wisdom is that Cory Booker did well last night. The other candidate who consensus wisdom suggested did well last night was Julian Castro. Why? Because he also tried to outwoke everybody. How woke is Julian Castro? Julian Castro is so woke that he believes that federally funded abortions should be available not just for women for the entirety of their pregnancy, but also for men. Seriously, 
He said this last night. He said that biological men should have a taxpayer-funded right to abortion, which is going to be weird. I mean, I got to admit, that's going to be weird. Giving an ultrasound to a man's prostate looking for a baby is going to be a weird thing. But deciding how to perform an abortion through a man's urethra is going to be very odd. But hey, if anybody can make this happen, Julian Castro can. Here he was last night explaining that biological men require abortion too. Would your plan cover abortion, Mr. Secretary? Uh, yes, it would. Uh, I don't believe only in reproductive uh, freedom. I believe in reproductive justice. And you know what that means is that just because a woman, or let's also not forget someone in the trans community, a trans female, uh, is poor, doesn't mean they shouldn't have the right to exercise that right to choose. And so I okay, absolutely uh, would. I'm just going to point out right to a trans person. female is a is a biological male. So it's a screw up. I'm sure he meant a trans male, meaning a female, a biological female who believes that she is a male. But he said a trans female. So presumably he also wants to make sure that a male who that that Caitlyn Jenner can have the abortion that Caitlyn Jenner so desperately needs. This Democratic Party, I'm going to say I think they may be slightly out of touch with mainstream America just a little bit, just a little bit. And it infected the entire party last night. It was pretty amazing. We'll get to more of that in just one second. First, I'm too busy to go to the post office. I'll be honest with you. The last time I went to the post office, I got a giant parking ticket because there's only one thing that LA authorities are good at, and that is giving parking tickets. Cleaning up the homeless problem, policing crime. Nope. Parking tickets, boom, right on it. So this is why I've decided no more of the post office. Instead, I'm going to go to stamps.com. It is fast and it is easy. Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. Postal Service directly to your computer. Whether you're a small office sending invoices or an online seller shipping out products or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, and any class of mail anywhere you want to send it. Once your mail is ready, just hand it off to the mail carrier or drop it in the mailbox. It is indeed that simple. With Stamps.com, you get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. Over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. Daily Wire is one of them. I use Stamps.com personally. Right now, my listeners get a special offer. It includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in Shapiro. That is Stamps.com. Enter Shapiro. Okay, we'll get to more of the Democratic debates in just one second. Plus, we'll preview tonight's Democrat debate. A lot coming up. You have to go subscribe. Dailywire.com, $9.99 a month. Get the subscription. Gives you the rest of this show. Gives you two additional hours of the show every day. Get the annual subscription. You also get the very greatest in beverage vessels. This right here, the leftist here is hot or cold tumbler. Ooh, it is a magical, magical vessel. So grab that because there are going to be lots of leftist tears over the coming weeks as they realize these debates are a complete crap show. We'll get to all of that in just a second. Also, subscribe because it helps protect us against the vicissitudes of the big tech companies, against the vicissitudes of the evil, malicious media matters left that seeks to destroy all opposing viewpoints by going after advertisers. Help us out by subscribing. Go over to dailywire.com. Make it happen. It's pretty great. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So the woke fest continued. With Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, then declaring that while Cory Booker may be a, a black man, and while Julian Castro may be calling for abortions for biological men, he is the father of a biracial son, and that means that he is woke in and of himself. Go for it, Bill de Blasio. I run the largest police force in America, too, and if we're going to stop these shootings, we're going to get these guns off the street, we have to have a very different relationship between our police and our community. I also want to say there's something that sets me apart from all my colleagues running in this race, and that is for the last 21 years, I've been raising a black son in America. And I have had to have very, very serious talks with my son, Dante, about how to protect himself on the streets of our city and all over this country, including how to deal with the fact that he has to take special caution because there have been too many tragedies between our young men and our police, too. OK, so he's trying to outwork everybody by saying, sure, I'm a giant white guy, but I have a biracial son. And that means that I'm I'm even more victimized in America than Cory Booker, who's a black person on the stage. So it was just a, it was a woke fest last night. Maybe this works in a primary. It's a theory. Maybe it works in the Twitter primary. Consensus seemed to be that de Blasio did OK, that Castro had a big breakout because he wants men to have abortions, that Cory Booker did great yesterday for some reason, I guess. Basically, everybody who's most woke did best. Amy Klobuchar tried to get into the act. 
Right? Amy Klobuchar, who's supposed to be the moderate, who's going to rival Joe Biden. She was the most interesting candidate in the field before she announced. Then she decided, I'm going to slide on over to the left. So she was asked about decriminalizing illegal immigration. So there's a big controversy that is now broken out about the about so-called Section 1325. Julian Castro attacked brutally Beto O'Rourke, suggesting that Beto O'Rourke was not, in fact, woke enough on illegal immigration. That, in fact, Section 1325, which criminalizes illegal immigration across the border, that's now considered a criminal misdemeanor if you do so between ports of entry. You show up at a port of entry, you apply for asylum, that's totally legal. You try to cross the Rio Grande River, that is a misdemeanor. The reason that that's a misdemeanor is because we are trying to drive people toward the ports of entry because if they don't go to the ports of entry, you know what happens sometimes, they die. Because it's a lot more dangerous to go over the Rio Grande than it is to walk to a port of entry. Now, naturally, the Democrats want to get rid of that provision of U.S. law and make it so that it's only like a civil fine if you cross the Rio Grande illegally. I suppose they think that won't incentivize people to cross illegally between ports of entry. What do they think that's going to do? Now, Amy Klobuchar, who should know better, says that she would consider decriminalizing illegal immigration. Let's talk about what Secretary Castro just said. He wants to no longer have it be a crime to illegally cross the border. Do you support that? Do you think it should be a civil offense only? And if so, do you worry about potentially incentivizing people to come here? Immigrants, they do not diminish America. They are America. Um, and I am happy to look at his proposal. But I do think you want to make sure that you have provisions in place that allow you to go after traffickers and allow you to go after people um, who are uh, violating the law. OK, so you know, there she is being somewhat moderate and just getting thrown out of the building, basically. She also pointed out this is going to be, again, an attack ad by Trump against the other Democrats. Here's Amy Klobuchar, Democratic senator, suggesting to Elizabeth Warren and Bill de Blasio, guys, kicking half of Americans off their health care. Maybe that's a bad idea. Maybe that's a bad pitch in a general election. You're one of the Democrats who wants to keep private insurance in addition to a government uh, health care plan. Why is an incremental approach, in your view, better than a sweeping overhaul? Well, I think it's a bold approach. It's something that Barack Obama wanted to do when we um, were working on the Affordable Care Act, and that is a public option. I am just simply concerned about kicking uh, half of America off of their health insurance in four years, which is exactly what this bill says. OK, so, she, I mean, that is going to be an attack ad. I mean, she, you have a Democratic senator openly acknowledging that they're talking about kicking 177 million people off of their health insurance. She didn't win any points for that. You know who else didn't win any points last night? Tim Ryan, the congressperson from Ohio. He's also slightly trying to edge into the moderate lane, but doing himself no favors. Here was Tim Ryan explaining that Democrats are out of touch with common people, after which Julian Castro and Cory Booker decided to fight over their black trans, disabled, little person constituent. We have a perception problem with the Democratic Party. We are not connecting to the working class people in the very states that I represent in Ohio, in the industrial Midwest. We've lost all connection. That We have got to change the center of gravity of the Democratic Party from being coastal mm -hmm. and elite, elitist and Ivy League, which is the perception, to somebody from the forgotten communities that have been left behind for the last 30 years, to get those workers back on our side. If we don't address that fundamental problem with our connection to workers, white, black, brown, gay, straight, working class people, you, none of this is going to get done, Chuck. OK, and that is the only pitch that matters. And that's the one that they are all going to ignore. Now, the other big exchange of the debate that was getting all sorts of attention was an exchange between Tim Ryan and Tulsi Gabbard. So Tulsi Gabbard, who is a congressperson from Hawaii and also Assad's favorite senator. So Bashar Assad has a very warm relationship with Tulsi Gabbard. She is not just an isolationist on foreign policy and a refugee from the X-Men, apparently. She's got this amazingly awesome shock of gray hair in the middle of a, of a completely black haircut. It's pretty, it's pretty great, actually. Uh, she and, and Tim Ryan went at it. And Tulsi Gabbard, I mean, the, the fact that this stuff gets cheered on national debate stages is pretty astonishing. Tim Ryan points out that the war in Afghanistan was justified because of 9-11, at which point Tulsi Gabbard says, what did the Taliban ever do to us? And she gets cheered. The reality of it is, if the United States isn't engaged, the Taliban will grow and they will have bigger, bolder terrorist acts. 
We have got to have some present there. As, the as, the as Taliban was Iraq. there long before we came in. They'll yeah, be and they there were, long yeah, before we exactly. leave. Well, we they cannot were. keep U.S. And troops they were deployed flying. to Afghanistan thinking that we're going to somehow squash this Taliban I that has say, been there that every other country that's tried has failed. I didn't say squash them. When we weren't in there, they started flying planes into our buildings. So I'm just saying right now, the we Taliban have an The Taliban didn't attack us on 9-11. Al-Qaeda did. Well, I understand. Al-Qaeda attacked I understand. us on 9-11. I understand. That's why I and so I many other people joined the military to go I after Al Qaeda, not the Taliban. the Taliban. That's why we joined to, to go after Al Qaeda, not the Taliban. Like, um, the Taliban was protecting Al Qaeda. That was the whole premise of the war in Afghanistan. George W. Bush offered the Taliban the opportunity to turn over Osama bin Laden and to allow us to go after Al Qaeda. They refused, and so we wrecked them. So, again, the fact that that was cheered and that Tim Ryan is cast out, good luck with this Democratic Party, guys. Now, the, the truth is that the best metaphor for all of this was the mic breakdown that happened in the middle of the debate. So in the middle of the debate, NBC really blew it. Some sound guy is about to get fired today because in the middle of this debate, they, the backstage audio could start being heard. And honestly, I was kind of gritting my teeth because as somebody who works in this industry and has a microphone on me a lot of times, I'm always counting on the audio guy not to have the mic on when I don't want it on so that people don't hear me going to the bathroom, for example. Well, basically, that's what happened on NBC News last night. Should there be a role for the federal here? government? Your other mics are on. I, uh, everybody's mics are on. I, I think we have a, I heard that too. That's okay. I think we had a little mic issue in the back. Control room, we've got contrary We have the, I think audio. we heard, yeah, we have the audience audio. Someone's got my binder. <laughs> <laughs> we heard. What's happening? We are hearing our colleagues' audio. You know, we prepared for yes. everything. Guess what, guys? We, did not prepare for we are going to take a quick break. We're going to get this technical uh, situation fixed. We will be right back. Very, very awkward. Donald Trump tweeted out about it. This really makes Donald Trump mad. <laughs> the production quality. You got to love the fact that, that Trump, because he was a TV star, all he cared about last night was the production quality. He tweeted out, NBC News and MSNBC should be ashamed of themselves for having such a horrible technical breakdown in the middle of the debate. Truly unprofessional and only worthy of a fake news organization, which they are. <laughs> they screw up the mics and he's like, <laughs> that wasn't even his best tweet. His best tweet last night was about half an hour into the debate and he just tweeted out one word, all caps. Boring. Fact check true. Fact check true, Mr. President. The, the Trump campaign then released a statement saying that the debate was the best argument for President Trump's re-election. That is 100% true. Campaign spokesperson Kayleigh McEnany said, quote, this debate was the best argument for President Trump's re-election and should really be counted as an in-kind contribution to the president's campaign. The Democrats proposed a radical government takeover of the American society that would demolish the American dream so many are gaining access to under the growing Trump economy. The far-left socialist policies Democrats embraced tonight were akin to a mutual political suicide pact. They want to throw 200 million people off their current private health care plans, put them into a government-run system that would eliminate choice, and crush innocent Americans with an enormous tax burden to pay for it. These Democrat policies, which feature government control over virtually every aspect of Americans' lives, bear striking resemblances to those from authoritarian regimes like Cuba and Venezuela. Perhaps it's fitting Democrats held their first debate in Miami, Florida, where so many Latinos have fled the ravages of socialism and understand its devastating effects on society in a real and personal way. Okay, this is true. I mean, if you watched that debate last night, and you are anywhere close to the middle of the American spectrum, I can't imagine this won you over. Now, that's not the goal of these primary debates, presumably. The goal is to appeal to the far left. But, but, that far left may not be that big. And Joe Biden thinks that, right? So Team Joe tweeted out last night in the middle of the debate, let's be clear, we shouldn't tear the Affordable Care Act down. We should build on it. The Biden administration will give every American the right to choose a public option like Medicare to ensure everyone has access to the quality, affordable health care they deserve. Hashtag Dem Debate. And so that is Biden militating against Elizabeth Warren, going directly at her and at Bernie Sanders. So Biden knows which lane he is in, apparently, and he is staying in that lane. And that is smart. Terry McAuliffe, the former Virginia governor, he said, listen, these Democrats are out of touch. He is correct. They are out of touch. I'm a little disappointed. Uh, I think we needed to have more discussion on those issues that actually affect Americans every single day. They didn't want to hear us talking about Mitch McConnell and we spent a lot of time on Medicare for all, but people sitting home, Anderson, right now, they're worried about their prescription drug costs. They're worried about getting in a car and, you know, driving and spend an hour and a half to go see their kids play a ball game. We needed more discussion on those issues that affect. I thought John Delaney was that exactly right when he answered that. Infrastructure, you know, prescription drugs, 
I didn't hear workforce training at all tonight. One of the biggest issues our country is facing. I never heard this ain't, this, ain't the, this ain't the primary for people living in the middle of the country. This is the primary for AOC. And here was AOC's take on this thing. She says, you know what the big problem was? That they didn't talk climate change enough. That was the big problem. I don't think that we are discussing climate change the way we need to be discussing climate change. It is such a huge, broad, systemic issue, and you can't just say, is Miami going to exist in 50 years? We need to say, what are you going to do about this? And I, I know there's a lot of folks, a lot of young people that have been mobilizing for an ent entire climate debate. Uh, in, in the Democratic caucus, I think it's a good idea. Okay, they're competing for AOC's vote. They're not competing for the guy in Ohio or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania. With God's help, Don, and Donald, this is Donald Trump's prayer, with God's help, the Democrats will continue to run down this path because good luck, gang, good luck. Okay, time for some things I like, and then we'll get to some things that I hate. So, things that I like today. I mentioned yesterday that this is basically the Dumbo clown car, and that the only question is going to be, which Democrat jumps from that top platform down into the bucket of water. And that means it's time for me to recommend Dumbo. Dumbo's a great movie, the original Dumbo. So here's a little bit of the original Dumbo trailer. The circus, certainly more entertaining in that film than it was last night. Dumbo, the little elephant who was all ears. The circus used to be charming. Now it's just a bunch of people competing over fringe votes. So that's that's very exciting stuff. Yeah, so that, so go watch the movie. The movie's fun. Don't don't watch the remake. The remake is apparently pretty bad. Uh, but the the original movie is still a great movie. My kids still love it because original Disney is best Disney. Original Disney is really really good stuff. Okay, other things that I like. You're never gonna believe this. You ready for this? Andrew Cuomo said a smart thing, or at least a not dumb thing. So Andrew Cuomo was asked specifically about Alexander Ocasio-Cortez comparing the situation on America's southern border to Nazi concentration camps. And Andrew Cuomo elevated himself for a moment above his brother Chris as the lesser of the, uh, less stupid of the Cuomo brothers. Here is Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, ripping into AOC. I think it's a wholly inappropriate comparison. Uh, the Holocaust, you're talking about uh, a a tragedy of biblical proportion and one of the greatest scourges uh, in history. Six million uh, Jews died during the Holocaust. Uh, there is no comparison to the Holocaust. Okay, so good for, Chris, uh, good for Andrew Cuomo, finally saying something not dumb. Congratulations, sir. It happens once every couple of years, maybe. No, good on you. Okay, other things that I like. So again, I'm, this is the day for me praising people who I will never praise again. Uh, Stephen Colbert went after Beto and Booker. And he has to because he's an Elizabeth Warren junkie. So here he was yesterday, last night, going after Beto O'Rourke and Cory Booker for speaking Spanish and making fools of themselves. I'll give you 10 seconds to answer. If you want to answer the direct question, would you support a 70% individual marginal tax rate? Yes, no, or pass? Um... <laughs> No habla inglés. <laughs> and when the topic turned to the border crisis, Booker took Beto's Spanish and raised him mucho más. Ha uh, demonizado los inmigrantes. Es inaceptable. Voy a cambiar reste. Oh, snap! It is. It is on. It is on. It is an Espanol off. Okay, so, yeah, it was obvious that, that, even the Democrats were pretty disappointed in the performance of their candidates last night. Now, tonight is the big one. Tonight, it's Bernie versus Biden. Old man club off, basically. It's, it's like that, that movie where, uh, what was it, Sylvester Stallone fought Robert De Niro? It's, it's like that one. So it's old people fighting each other tonight. Very much looking forward to that. Pete Buttigieg standing off to the side crying about South Bend and all this. It, it, should, be, it should be more of a party. Tonight, Bernie Sanders, by the way, has to be feeling good about himself because Elizabeth Warren did not distinguish herself from the pack last night. Elizabeth Warren did not have a breakout night. And that means it's time for Bernie. We're going to come in. We're going to clean up like with the USSR in Ukraine in 1932. We're going to clean it up. Pretty dark humor there. So there's Bernie. who He's saying he said last night, watch tonight because tonight's the progressive, the progressives turn. Elizabeth Warren's like, I've always been progressive. He's like, you have not. I was here in 1822. You were not. Yeah, being progressive. 
I knew Karl Marx. I met him. You all know Karl Marx. So here, here is Bernie Sanders talking about Medicare for all, which is, of course, his pitch. And he's taking it back from Elizabeth Warren. The major issue is, do we believe that health care is a human right or not? Now, some people do. Some people don't. I do. So I think whether you are poor or working class or rich, you are entitled to all the health care that you need because you're an American. That's what I believe. This is a dysfunctional system. Our health care outcomes are not as good as people in other countries. We have got to have a health care system not to make the insurance companies rich, not to make the drug companies rich, but to guarantee health care to all people in a cost effective way. That's Medicare for all. So if you liked tonight, last night, you will love tonight when you get the best, the cream of the crop, the front runners in the Democratic Party. I'm so excited. You know what? We're going to have to go to break. Uh, I guess I'll see you here later for two more hours of coverage, or I'll see you here tomorrow. We'll recap the whole thing for you. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Robert Sterling, directed by Mike Joyner, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, and our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. Hola, mamacitas. The first Democratic presidential primary debate was last night, and everyone started speaking Spanish. We will examine why los Democrats son muy estupidos. Then my pal Jamil Giovanni stops by to explain why young men get radicalized. Finally, the mailbag. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. 